Welcome to the Federal Aviation Administration Spin Awareness Video. This video is a product of the FAA's Safer Skies Agenda, a renewed commitment between FAA and the industry to develop educational programs designed to reduce the number of aviation accidents. Hi, I'm Tom Paul Berezny, President of EAA. One of our important missions is safety, whether it's safety in building or flying. That mission is shared by the International Aerobatic Club, a division of EAA. IEC is a competitive aerobatic organization, but more importantly, their focus on safety reaches all pilots flying all types of airplanes. They've had an outstanding safety record over the last 30 years in aerobatic competition. It's because of that record that FAA commissioned IC to prepare the video that you're about to see. IC partnered with another EAA affiliate, the National Association of Flight Instructors, the Teachers of Flight, in preparing this information. I hope you find it to be educational, informational, and more importantly, of value in making you a safer pilot. Enjoy the program. Michael Goulian can boast such accomplishments as being named U.S. Unlimited National Champion, being a three-time member of the U.S. National Aerobatic Team, and securing multiple medals at the World Aerobatic Championships. Goulian is also a certified flight instructor, specializing in aerobatic instruction. In his spare time, he amazes crowds with spectacular airshow performances. Debbie Rin Harvey's long list of credentials includes being a three-time top finishing female at the U.S. National Aerobatic Championships. She has also represented the United States in eight World Aerobatic Championships, where she flew away with a number of medals, including a gold team medal in 1988. Rin Harvey, like Goulian, is a certified flight instructor, an examiner, and is a captain for Southwest Airlines. The FAA has identified six categories into which the large majority of general aviation accidents can be classified. Number two on that list is loss of control. In fact, loss of control associated with inadvertent stall spins continues to account for roughly 10% of all general aviation accidents and 25% of fatal accidents. You know, Debbie, unless you're a certified flight instructor or you've taken unusual attitude training, you've probably never really experienced a spin. You're right, Mike. During this program, we'll take a detailed look at a few common stall spin accident scenarios, scenarios that have plagued general aviation since the earliest days of powered flight. And we'll also discuss strategies and techniques that can help you recognize and avoid a stall spin accident. The first scenario that we'll see is an engine failure after takeoff and the pilot trying to make what the FAA terms as its impossible turn, or the turn back to the runway. The turn around an obstacle, here again it's another steep turn, improper usage of rudder and uh, airplane trying to overbank in this steep turn. The last of the stall spin scenarios is the skidded base to final turn. In the classic case, a tailwind on the base leg or the pilot's misjudgment of the turn has resulted in the airplane overshooting the extended runway centerline. On the surface, these accident scenarios may seem unrelated, but they share a number of common traits. All occur at low altitude, where there's little margin for error. They all involve mishandling of pitch and yaw controls while operating at high angles of attack. They involve pilot distraction, wherein the pilot's primary duty, flying the airplane, is forgotten. They involve poor decision making by the pilot as well. And as the scenarios advance ever closer to the stall spin, Adrenaline and fear impede the pilot's ability to cope with the situation. Before we go flying, let's go to the classroom and we'll talk about some characteristics of stalls and spins. Well, Debbie, I think the first thing that we need to talk about is what a stall really is. Now, the angle between the cord line and the relative wind, this angle here, is what we call the angle of attack. So anytime we get our aircraft beyond a certain angle of attack, which is anywhere between 15 and 20 degrees in a light general aviation airplane, we begin to stall the wing or we start to see some airflow separation. The airflow, once you've exceeded this critical angle of attack, 
has a hard time staying attached to that airfoil and towards the back of that airfoil starts spilling off and it can't stay attached to rejoin the air that went under the wing. So you'll start seeing this air or feeling the air spill off the top back of the wing and that's what we call buffet. And the buffet that we feel in that control yoke is simply the horizontal stabilizer flying through the disturbed air and that's really one of the great indications that we have of a stall. Another thing that all of the manufacturers uh, install in the airplanes is really the stall horn. And the third thing is the stick position. There is no better indication of how close we are to a stall or what our stall margin is as to how far the stick is back. As the stick comes back our stall margin decreases so I can be flying in the back seat of my decathlon teaching an aerobatic student, I don't even need to know what the airspeed indicator says. I know how close to a stall I am, both either doing a loop or slowing down to show a stall or in a stern just by where the stick position is. And that's really my greatest indicator of my stall margin. The airspeed and the airspeed indicator are really secondary means of stall indication. Angle of attack is really what we're concerned with. Okay. There are some other factors that affect the stall, some being contamination on the wing. We talk about ice, things as small as bugs, dirt, uh, any type of contamination on the leading edge of the wing that will disturb the airflow over the wing affects the stall. Another thing that affects the stall is the weight of the aircraft. Obviously this little wing needs to support the whole weight of the airplane, so the heavier the aircraft we also have an increase in stall speed. And the last thing I think we should probably talk about, and the most important one, and something that a lot of people don't really understand, is bank angle and its effect in correlation with the load factor. Some people call it G-force or load factor. It's really the same thing. And we've put three airplanes on the board here for the discussion purposes, just a training Cessna 152. And when I train my students, I try to teach them that the wing is most efficient in level flight. It's designed to fly in level flight, and that's where its peak performance is. But when we start to put that airplane on its side or bank the airplane, we lose some of its lifting efficiency and some of its vertical component now has to become horizontal component. Well, what does that really mean? It means when we bank the plane, the wing's lifting capability isn't really as efficient as we want it to be. So what will happen when we bank the airplane? If we don't do anything, the nose will drop in the turn. The airplane will turn with horizontal component of lift but it will descend. So what do we need to do as pilots to maintain level flight? We need to bring in a little bit of back pressure. What does that do? As we just said, when we bring the back pressure in, the stick comes back. What happens when the stick comes back? The angle of attack increases. Well, we can see here at a 45 degree bank, the stall speed is increased to 48 knots because we have a higher load factor on the airplane in the turn. And then if we exaggerate that more to 60 degrees of bank, the stall speed on a Cessna 152 is 57 knots. Well, amazingly enough, the best angle of climb speed on a Cessna 152 is right around 57 knots. And we're not really used to looking at the airspeed indicator around 60 knots and seeing a stall. But if we're in a 60 degree bank turn and we're slow and we're turning and we're trying to maintain level flight, we're closer to the stall margin than we really think. And that's really, I think, one of the biggest uh, stall spin scenarios is a tight turn like that steep angle of bank looking at an object on the ground and that starts our stall spin scenario. Regardless of the airplane, each bank angle corresponds to a specific G load during steady turns. For example, zero bank angle is equivalent to 1 G. 30 degrees of bank results in 1.15 G's. 45 degrees of bank results in 1.41 G's and 60 degrees of bank results in 2 G's. And remember that stalls can occur at any airspeed, in any attitude, at any power setting. The stall in itself is a very gentle, a very benign maneuver that we learn really from the, our earliest phases of flight training. All the stall really is is a, is a loss of lift that we recover by simply easing forward on the back elevator pressure that we have, reducing the angle of attack and the airplane flies again. It's the coupling of the yaw and the stall that gets us into our incipient spin. There's many factors, as we've learned, of yaw that occur. The first one is really improper use of the rudder. We either use too much rudder or not enough rudder. And really, 
what we mean by improper use of the rudder? Anytime we fly in uncoordinated flight, all the time you look down, you're going to turn the balls outside. Oh, shoot, I need a little bit of rudder. I look the other way, the ball's on the inside. It happens to all of us. Well, anytime we're in uncoordinated flight, we're really flying with a side slip or a yaw, and that in a stalled condition will lead to the beginning of a spin or one wing coming over the top or, or auto rotation as it's called. And another very, very big factor of yaw is all of the left turning tendencies that come with uh, flying an airplane with a reciprocating engine or a propeller driven airplane. We talk about P factor, spiraling slipstream, and, and torque as the major concerns. Pilots need to recognize and break the two-part process of stalling and yawing before it happens. We cannot rely on any one particular cue. We must continuously integrate all the available cues together to form an overall picture of our stall potential. The first scenario has the engine failing after takeoff, where the pilot tries to make an immediate turn back to the runway. Some of the common errors making this a deadly strategy are not enough altitude to safely execute the turn. In the urgency of the situation, the pilot may bank the aircraft too steeply, increasing the angle of attack to a dangerous level through wing loading. Hoping to speed up the turn, the pilot tries to help the turn rate with uncoordinated rudder. This is a deadly combination low to the ground. Under the stress of the low altitude emergency, airspeed control is often overlooked and the aircraft moves ever closer to an uncoordinated accelerated stall where recovery may not be possible. The proper way to do a takeoff situation and the possibility of losing an engine or having another emergency after soon after takeoff when we lose an engine, the best thing is to know the glide speed of your aircraft, pitch for best glide speed, and land straight ahead, or no more than 30 degrees either side of the aircraft's uh, original heading. Better to land under control than to try to turn back and have a uh, accidental uh, stall spin situation. In scenario number two, the pilot is circling a house, group of friends, or other points of interest on the ground. This time we're going to go around a point, and we have a pond out here that we're circling around. We're going to get steeper and steeper, and we're going to increase the angle of bank, and we step on the rudder to move the wing out of the way because it got in the way. We want to see the point, and so we step on the rudder, and before you know it, you're on your back. Relax the elevator no matter what attitude that nose is in. Even though you're pointed straight at the ground, you still have to relax the elevator, level the wings, and return back to normal level or cruise flight. Now Debbie is going to repeat the scenario, this time with the application of top rudder, as if trying to prevent the nose from going below the horizon. Circling a point, we get steeper, the nose tries to fall, so we step on top rudder. And it's going to be an accelerated stall, which the aircraft is closer and closer to stall speed, it rolls over the top. We relax the elevator, roll the aircraft wings level with rudder and aileron and then pitch the nose back up to just above the horizon. On the turn around a point or turn around a ground object, we want to make sure that we don't induce yaw with rudder and that you just bury your bank to control your drift and circle around that point. 
as we go faster and we get downwind, the bank angle needs to steepen up and increase the pitch attitude slightly to compensate for that increased bank. Stall speed increases as bank increases. You can stall the airplane, but as long as you don't give it yaw with rudder, you'll be okay as far as a spin is concerned. The aircraft can't spin if it doesn't have yaw. Feel it in your seat if you get pushed to the inside of the turn or the side that you're turning into you know that you probably need some rudder. And you're not More on the feeling and detection of yaw will be discussed in the exercise portion of this presentation. The last scenario is the skidded base to final turn. In the classic case, a tailwind on the base leg or the pilot's misjudgment of the turn has resulted in the airplane overshooting the extended runway center line. We're going to simulate that the road is the, the center line of the runway, misjudging the wind situation or mis just misjudging the rate of turn that was, is necessary to turn on to final. We get blown beyond the extended center line of the runway. Now steeply banked with low airspeed and a high angle of attack, the pilot applies rudder to expedite the turn. Unfortunately, the rudder does not have the desired effect and simply yaws the nose down below the horizon, while causing the bank angle to become even steeper. Often the pilot freezes on the rudder and focuses instead on recovering the nose low pitch attitude by pulling further aft on the elevator control. Simultaneously, the pilot applies opposite aileron to control the steepening bank angle. These are perfect inputs for an abrupt spin entry. What we want to do is, if we see that we're going to get blown beyond the center line, either steepen up the bank, but keep the nose down so that you can steepen up the bank and not get close to critical angle of attack. If you don't feel comfortable steepening up the bank, then level the wings and go around. These scenarios share a common thread. The airplane is allowed to operate too close to the critical angle of attack with the presence of yaw or side slip. Let's take a look at two basic flight maneuvers that influence yaw. Anytime our nose is above the horizon, you'll notice the airplane wants to yaw to the left. The ball goes to the right, but also we can feel it in our body. Our body gets pushed to the right. And you'll notice if you look out the front of the airplane, the airplane is yawing to the left. What we can do with our feet flat on the floor is you notice the yaw. If you push on the right rudder to stop the yaw to keep the nose straight ahead of you to keep it on a point, it takes right rudder. Now all of a sudden you're balanced in the seat. Debbie brings out a very good point on feeling and reacting to yaw. In essence, you as the pilot can become like a ball in a turn coordinator. If you feel yourself being pushed to the left, you know you need left rudder. Conversely, if you feel yourself being pushed to the right, you need right rudder. Bottom line is to be active in seeking that balanced position in your seat. Notice that when we bank into a left turn, the nose will yaw to the right initially and then come to the left. So left bank, the nose goes off to the right and then goes to the left. And we'll do the same to the right. When you bank to the right, the nose initially yaws to the left and then yaws back to the right. So what we need to do to correct for that yaw the wrong direction is use a little bit of rudder in the direction of our bank. So we roll into a left bank turn and a little bit of left rudder and the nose stays in front of you. You stay balanced in the seat. As we roll out of the turn, roll back to the right with a little right rudder 
the nose stays turning to the right and it doesn't yaw off heading. Let's review some exercises that promote awareness and coordination. What we can do now is we pick a point out ahead of us and we just roll from a left bank to a right bank. It's an exercise for rudder coordination and uh, yaw coordination. So just look outside. Don't look at the slip and skid indicator. And we'll just try and keep our nose on that little city way out ahead. We roll from a left bank to a right bank. We want to try to bank about 30 degrees and just keep the nose on a point. All right. At the same time, the rudder is a reaction to the aileron just to keep the nose in line. So it's left aileron, left rudder, right aileron, right rudder. This is an excellent exercise for coordinating your rudder with your ailerons. It will also optimize the rolling ability of your aircraft, which can be very useful when encountering situations such as wake turbulence. Stalls. We'll just do a stall straight ahead. Stalls can occur in any attitude, any power setting, and at any speed. As Debbie slows the airplane, notice the angle between the wing and the flight path is increasing. Because angle of attack is what ultimately defines when a stall occurs, it would be very advantageous to a pilot to maintain awareness of this angle in conjunction with airspeed. Also, as the angle of attack approaches the critical angle where stall occurs, awareness of side slip is paramount in preventing unwanted lateral control problems. Proper management of yaw is required for clean brakes during the stall. As Debbie approaches the critical angle of attack by pulling back on the elevator, Notice that she is managing the yaw with rudder, allowing no heading change, which results in a wing's level break. She then applies full power and lowers the nose slightly to reattach the airflow across the wings. As airspeed increases to a safe level, complete the recovery using the procedures listed in the flight manual for the aircraft you're flying. All right. Another stall. Just slow the airplane down. This stall will do out of a turn to show that the airplane stalls at a higher speed in a turn, only because if we maintain altitude, it requires in a turn more back pressure, higher pitch angle, higher angle of attack. We roll into a turn, hold our altitude. To hold our altitude, we have to hold back on the elevator pull back on the nose to hold the altitude, which puts you closer to the critical angle of attack. There's the stall. We relax, level the wings, pull the nose up, power in, maintain the best rate of climb speed, and then reduce the drag of the landing gear if it's a retractable, and pull it up. Keep in mind that the stalls practiced during training are generally conducted as intentional maneuvers high above the ground. While stall practice is important for all pilots, realize that these intentional stalls represent a small sampling of the many stalls possible, not just the select few we become familiar with during stall training. Regardless of your experience, don't be embarrassed if you're uncomfortable with stalls or if you don't feel confident to practice the solo exercises that we've recommended. It might be interesting to know that a number of today's top aerobatic pilots, including myself, once feared stalls and spins. But we overcame our fears by seeking out competent and understanding instructors. Some additional dual instruction can turn your own fears about stalls and spins into renewed confidence. Never stop being a student. Learn all you can about stalls and spins. Stay current with slow flight, know the limits of your airplane and your own skills. Exercise good judgment, especially when flying near the ground. Get some additional duel once in a while and learn to break the two-part chain of stalling and yarring. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. More importantly, I hope you've gained valuable insights that will make you a better and safer pilot. If you're interested in learning more about aircraft performance, consider joining IAC. They have outstanding information available for its members. If you're a flight instructor, 
Nafi welcomes you. Clear skies and safe flying.